uh, we're almost ready. So give us a minute and then we'll be official. Namaste. Uh, Timila ma'am, Azulai, welcome to the program. So welcome to the program, ma'am. Uh, today we are honored to have veteran in the information technology field, Professor Timila Yemi Thapa, for the fourth session of Genes Tech Talk. In Genes Tech Talk, we will focus on personal experience of the guest about their challenges, low times, and how they overcome these problems. We will celebrate the significant work they have done and the value they have added in the technology sector of Nepal. We will also hear from the young and dynamic people about their plans and innovations. Also, we will discuss the existing opportunities, problems, and probable solutions in the sector of technology in Nepal and across the world. Today, we have with us respected Timila Yemi Thapa, ma'am, who is the professor of Institute of Engineering, Trivon University. We hope this talk would inspire thousands of Nepalese working in diverse sectors, and it would be an engaging discussion with Timila, ma'am. Her journey to academics and contribution to the IT sector as a whole is an inspiring roller coaster of its own. In this hour and a half program, we will dwell deep into Timila Ma'am's journey and learning. So again, Ma'am, welcome to the program once again. Uh, we would like to start hearing how your childhood was, where you were born, uh, where you grew up, and about your schooling as well, Ma'am. Well, I was born in uh, in uh, the place called Khyokyava, near Kathmandu, uh, Ganeshthan near Santi Nikuzya school. That is, I think that is more known. And uh, well, uh, I was born in a, I was lucky to be born in a family where uh, they, they encourage girls to be like boys. And uh, other thing is I, I studied in a, a girls school uh, called Kanti Isuri Rajay Lakshmi. And that school, uh, those days, uh, the, the normal, normal thing was, you know, like, if you are studying, I joined class four. Yeah. Okay, sorry, ma'am. Please continue. Yes. So the it it was uh, we we belong to a very conservative, very conservative business class family, and uh, we belong to business class family and and focused on a lot of rituals and puja path and <laughs> and uh, normally girls uh, when if some families who send out girls for studies, you know, they, they start saying enough is enough in class five or class six and the time to get married. So in class eight and nine, you know, my friends started getting married and that used to be the criteria that, okay, put you, you know, enough is enough. So mostly by class 10 after school, uh, you know, the, the next, next uh, step is uh, getting a lot of proposals and getting engaged in, you know, wearing a lot of uh, jewelries and good clothes and going for uh, temples, you know, where there is a show, I think. This is a road show kind of thing that look, we have beautiful girls and, you know, uh, more towards the marriage proposals and all like that. So in that kind of environment, the environment was like that. And uh, luckily inside my family, Inside my family, especially my mother, my mother never wanted uh, us to, we were six daughters, my, and my mother never wanted us to be like other families. So, so then that was the experience in the girls, studying in girls college was, it was a totally different environment and different kind of thinking. And then after that, I went to Askal, Amrit Science College, uh, science education. And science education was those days when I joined, it was uh, not encouraged. You know, girls, uh, a lot of families thought that science, taking science subjects, you know, girls would fail and then would not be go ahead and study. So normally girls went for arts courses. So, and I took mathematics and uh, taking mathematics itself, you know, for a girl, 
people used to say, my God, how can you, how, how will you, how will you go ahead with mathematics? It's so difficult. So science subject and mathematics subject is considered uh, for boys, not for girls. So then after clearing that, then I went to engineering for engineering at IIT Kanpur. I landed up in a class of 400 boys and we were only two girls in a class. And that itself was a big, a big uh, jump start for me. And it was, it was uh, so difficult uh, to really, uh, you know, understand. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, anyway, that was, that was a great experience for uh, two girls to be in a class of 400. And we managed. And uh, boys were very, very good. You know, they were, uh, they were all toppers from uh, India. And uh, well, you know, in Indian society, toppers means they are rajas in the house. And uh, a student from IITK used to be, you know, looked upon as wow, great and all. So we had, uh, we had very good treatment from the society there. And the teachers, were very harsh on grading and relative grading. Studying was very hard, but yet they were very good teachers who took individual interest on students, individual interest on students to uh, really uh, look forward for good career development, all round development. And so that was a, that was a real uh, good place to grow up with. So ma'am, uh, I think it's a very interesting journey that you have gone through. Yeah. Uh, okay, you have gone through from Nepal to uh, right. India and did the engineering. Uh, would you like to highlight which year you are actually talking about? So when did you start your schooling? Yeah, schooling class four. So exactly, I don't recall which year it is, but uh, you know, uh, class four would be, I don't know, Kunsalu, I, I don't recall the... That's fine, ma'am. So I think you went to IIT Kanpur around 1979. 1970. In 1970, I got enrolled. So that is almost 50 years before now. Yes. So yes. we're talking like 50 years before uh, a woman, a female from Nepal who went to India to do the engineering in IIT Kanpur. You know, yeah. I have been working with a lot of women-led organizations in Nepal recently to promote, um, you know, women in tech. Now, yeah. you know, yeah. looking at the current situation, which is 50 years after, and 50 years before, when you went to uh, India from Nepal, what were the challenges, ma'am, uh, in that particular time in the society? What were the challenges you faced? And how did you got support from your uh, family to go to India and study? Well, uh, in fact, uh, I, I, uh, when I got selected and when, when I was to depart for Kanpur IIT, uh, I didn't get any support. I didn't get any support. Actually, my mother had died that year and uh, all the relatives and the families, you know, relatives, some of them tend to be little mothers in absence of real mother. Yeah. And they'll say, you will not get married. And no, 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 you are not supposed to go outside the country and study. And you will not have, uh, you, will, uh, you will not be considered eligible for marriage. I think that was the most, that was the thinking of the society then. So, so it was, it was my, it was, uh, of course, my father was there. And uh, my mother before die, he, she died. She had, uh, she knew that all these things would happen. And she had really mentored us to be strong and think and think your way and not listen to a lot of relatives and not guided by such uh, traditional thinking. Uh, that, that really helped us, uh, me uh, particularly. And uh, I not only went there, I went, I went with a little sister of mine. She was 10 years old. I went with her and then uh, you're talking about the challenges. It was the academic challenges was it, there was such a, huge gap between education standard of Nepal and education of standard of IITK. So that, that gap itself was a huge challenge for me particularly. And uh, taking a little girl with me was another, 
another <laughs> it's a big story there and uh, luckily my my sister really managed everything that she so you know you mentioned that you have done your schooling in girls only school yes. where i think um, you know all the students or all of your friends were girls so could you recall you know how many students were there in your class at that point of time and how many people in the current state they are in tech sector now oh well uh, when i finished class uh, 10 uh, if i were to look at the photograph of slc uh, uh, photograph uh, being taken by the school i think it would be something like 15 girls who who uh, finished uh, the certificate uh, slc and rest of them were married off there were many more and out of that uh, i do recall pratibha bhatrai was uh, she she became a well known uh, medical doctor in nepal and uh, i think there's somebody who who has gone into social se- sector social ngo ngo something like that so there i see her role uh, being played well and uh, Hi. that's that's interesting ma'am so out of 15 people so only a couple of you know handful of uh, people yeah. had done really well in terms of their you know career uh, or in the technology sector itself so yes. you know i mean currently as well there is so much challenge and 50 years before we can we can just imagine you know how much challenges there have been and the, you know the phases the obstacles that we have gone through as well so looking at the current state ma'am what do you suggest to the new young girls who are looking to have career into engineering or technology uh, what do you say is the one key thing uh, in order to uh, achieve success in their career yeah I, this this part i i have really uh, looked into this aspect uh, and also i have created a facebook page of my own timila emi thapa facebook page where where i have uh, i have posted couple of uh, experiences of uh, similar experiences or uh, experiences of kanpur iit where uh, 50 years ago if i if i have to analyze 70 decade 70 to 80 or uh, 60 to 70 decade the girls enrollment in engineering field was very minimum like i i went from uh, nepal uh, in my class you know 400 boys and only two girls so to get into elite uh, you know premier institute uh, itself was a big challenge and uh, two years uh, junior uh, batch had no girls in the class so how i look at it is 50 years ago the scenario in southeast asia Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, everywhere, I think it was a very, very similar scenario. As far as girls getting into engineering colleges, that too in a, in a very prestigious, uh, well-known, uh, competitive environment. So, so that, uh, that kind of experience was, I, I would say a lot of girls from, from India faced a similar experience. And how I would like to uh, tell the young girls young girls trying to aspire for going for uh, let's say engineering field is you take it up nothing stops you you know you if you want to do it you do it that's all uh, there's nothing uh, looking back and not listening to anybody that you know they, it's it's a, it's a great knowledge and that you, that takes you ahead and uh, there will be a lot of obstacles getting married during that time girls in india also had uh, difficulty getting married and those who got married had difficulty adjusting to the uh, the families of the boys so it was very similar kind of experience in nepal in the region in the southeast asia so i think i would i would advise the girls to go through my facebook page in milaimi thapa where i have uh, there are a couple of stories about our girls hostel students 
uh, in spite of all the difficulties they have they have done wonder wonders in the world not in india not only in the india they have performed wonderful uh, performance in the world so definitely ma'am i think you are, you are an inspiration for all those young girls who are seeking to have career in tech career in it and engineering but who who fear that you know maybe it's difficult for girls maybe i think it is high time for them to think that it was probably you know quite lot difficult at the time when you started but now yeah. things has been much more easier and if they have will power i don't think there is anything that can stop them from achieving yeah. the degree and then doing well in the career as well um again you know i would like to thank you ma'am for being inspiration for all the girls out there in nepal and international as well uh, so adding on it ma'am um, as you are like you know only handful of uh, female in engineering degree in india um, again 50 years back i wouldn't imagine india was too developed as well in terms of probably how they were treating um, you know the female into the education side so how was your experience over there uh, ma'am so was the society different compared to nepal was it exactly similar and can you mention some of the challenges you and your female colleague faced over there well uh, engineering uh, engineering uh, uh, institutes in other parts of india i'm sure would be different than where i studied uh, 400 boys in the class were i think very engaged in competitive environment so everybody was number one in school and uh, in the class also you know everybody was so busy in the, in the competition and uh, so even the teachers uh, teachers and the whole environment was a very highly competitive environment and uh, the treating girls and uh, uh, you know uh, behavior pattern towards the girl was far better i would say than than other maybe other engineering colleges they were they were very my classmates were very very good very nice and uh, they have done very well and we have every year we have alumni meet they have all become very old and but still joking and they were big jokers and very supportive and very friendly my experience was very positive very really good to hear really great to hear that ma'am that you had such yeah. a wonderful experience um, even 50 years back and i hope all of the young girls who are seeking to have career in tech and it and engineering uh, would have similar support from their fellow peers in nepal and international as well so yeah. ma'am going back to your you know uh, background in india so you studied in india uh, you did your engineering from there you even worked for i think couple of years over there you were with your younger sister so what made you return to nepal ma'am i i think uh, probably for you know people like you well educated you could have a really good career in india so what made you you know return back to nepal ma'am or even internationally you could have an international level the career the career uh, in india uh, more than that we had you know our visa was open for uh, best universities in usa especially so all last number of my batch peers and my juniors my uh, seniors they they moved to us for further studies for job and uh, i had equal opportunities i also i too had all that opportunities but coming back to nepal you know i had four younger sisters we were six sisters one, one brother <laughs> so the family responsibility <coughs> sorry the family responsibility was uh, i was really loaded with lot of responsibilities and uh, on top of that my father expired in 1975 when i returned my fa- father was no longer there so we had to stand up on our own and uh, so that 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 was the main reason otherwise if that my father had not passed away maybe i would have been studying in us for masters phd or whatever i would i would have gone into that track i had i had a great chance after i 
Exactly, ma'am. I think uh, probably, uh, you know, you could have even had a better career and better growth perspective if you had, you know, decided to go to Western countries, but rather you decided to come to Nepal. Uh, so could you please share your experience on what you have been doing after you came to Nepal? Uh, we all know you had a very, you know, long career history in Institute of Engineering, but we'd definitely like to hear uh, your involvement and what you have, uh, you know, done in terms of contribution to IOE. Well, uh, after graduation, you know, I worked for uh, a research project in IIT Kanpur for three years. And uh, that, that, that was the time that really built, built even added some value, more value into it. And I had to be in IIT Kanpur partly because my, I had to admit my younger sister in Delhi School of Planning Architecture, another school for another sister for PhD in IARI uh, Delhi. So I, I was more uh, engaged that way. And so after three years, I returned to Nepal. And then, then I had a chance to join Nepal Telecom, Electricity Authority, wherever you know, everybody wanted. And uh, I, chose to, I chose to join uh, the academic field uh, because uh, I, I, I seriously felt that uh, the kind of uh, uh, five IITs uh, I, I went through, uh, Nepal seriously lacked uh, resources uh, to, like me, uh, you know, to really take care of uh, education, engineering education in Nepal. So I joined I IOE, and uh, it, the that time uh, there were only uh, three years overseer degree, Institute of Engineering, overseer degree, and then so we really had to fight it out. That come on, you 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 phase out uh, these overseer courses and then start engineering. Especially in electronics engineering was started in 1994. That was too late already. So 1994, we uh, we were, we worked very hard to start that. Then 1994, I went to uh, UK, the Montfort University, my for my master's degree and for my research work. And I moved there, and then I came back and uh, went into IT field. The degree was in IT, IT field. So uh, then I straight jumped into the Ministry of Industry. Polana uh, Chalise was the secretary then. And uh, so I started pushing him that, uh, look, uh, this IT field, IT industry, you know, I, I saw that evolving in UK and a uh, large number of companies in India also, you know, uh, the outsourcing work and all that starting. So I briefed all that. So they were not, uh, they were not, uh, they were aware of such uh, uh, opportunities. And then I, I joined Computer Association. In Computer Association, there was- I, I would like to um, actually ask a little bit more details on your engagement to, to open the computer department. You know, as we discussed last time, you mentioned that after you get back from UK, uh, yeah. you actually, you know, uh, played a very vital role in order to start the computer engineering division uh, in IOE, yeah. right, ma'am? So would you like to, you know, share your experience on the challenges and obstacles that you faced uh, while, yeah. you know, setting up the division? Uh, because computer was a very new division there. And I don't think, yeah. um, you know, uh, computer, I mean, it's in the global scenario itself, it was very new. So we would be very keen to hear, ma'am, your challenges to set up the computer division uh, within IOE. Okay, okay. With, uh, well, uh, Institute of Engineering those days was more focused towards civil engineering and architecture, you know, it's more civil oriented kind of uh, education going on. And uh, so we started electronic engineering. After I came back from, uh, from uh, UK, uh, I, I, I really went around, uh, you know, convincing the vice chancellor of Trivian University to start a wing of computer engineering. And uh, the, the biggest challenge I faced was lack of fund. And they were not ready to actually increase the, the teacher's uh, uh, permanent post uh, to, be, to be announced. And they were not ready at all. So, so because of that, uh, you know, uh, in the institute, the faculty members who had only electronic engineering background. And I was the only one, I was the only one coming back from UK, uh, had gone through all those courses. 
So starting uh, computer engineering department was very tough and I had to take up a lot of courses and then uh, start, uh, you know, uh, lobbying for uh, increasing the faculty post uh, in the university, which was, which was not easy at all. They should have funded uh, that department uh, to initiate such important uh, program. Uh, so we didn't, I don't, I, we didn't get that kind of support uh, to build up. Uh, so so ma'am, you know, looking yeah. in the international scenario, I mean, uh, you study in IIT Kanpur, later you study in UK, and the world has already seen uh, how the computer was impacting, uh, right? Uh, so the focus on computing, a lot of electri electrical engineer, electronics engineer, they moved into computing field and they have already become like professors in a lot of big universities globally. But what what is the reason ma'am nepal uh, when we look into you know i actually you, you took initiation to start the engineering in ioe but if if we see the history i think it was probably started around 1998 i believe the computer you know department so 1990 to 2020 now it's almost 22 years ma'am the initiation was great but uh, there's a lot of complaint in the market that, you know, the syllabus is very old and it's outdated as well. And it is not coping up or it is not able to catch up with the rest of the world. So what would be the reason, ma'am, that, you know, the initiation started, but then, you know, it was delayed and it wasn't able to, uh, you know, succeed so quickly uh, or catch up with the rest of the world, ma'am? Uh, I don't think uh, the problem, you know, the bureaucrats, the university bureaucracy and the education ministry, industry ministry, who is supposed to start up this thing, the entire bureaucracy uh, uh, personnel, you know, they, they, they were very traditional oriented. And uh, I, went, I even went uh, fighting for uh, a substantial budget like 10 crore rupees. Uh, for uh, to be funded for uh, the department. And they did uh, take out uh, the 10 crore budget, uh, but it was utilized for, you know, uh, the private sector training centers, you know, everything was diverted. So really the kind of resources needed for computer engineering department, uh, uh, the fund was diverted. And that, that is where, you know, I have, I still have very bitter feeling. And uh, the plane should have taken up very well. I even approached Pankaj Jalote, the, the head of department of IIT Kanpur. Uh, to, in 2000, I went and met him. And uh, well, it's, it's again shortage of funds, shortage of resources. And, and they were uh, going skyrock uh, in, the, in terms of uh, development. And so we were small fries. <laughs> And uh, things were very difficult, very challenging, but still uh, students were good. I was students. No doubt, no, no doubt, because what we have seen, you have already spent your you know, 35 years of, uh, of your career in tech, uh, in you know, um, IOE, teaching IOE. students in IOE. Uh, and we have seen awesome students actually who were produced you know, throughout that duration from IOE you know, yes. leading, uh, internet, leading positions in the international organization itself. There's no doubt. Yeah. But shall I make a bold statement, ma'am? If probably, you know, the curriculum would have been updated and probably oh. if the IIT Kanpur collaboration would have taken at that point of time. Yeah, with, if, that 10 crore had... rupees, with that 10 crore rupees, you know, would have really gone, uh, you know, far ahead. Uh, sure, sure, of course. And uh, as far as curriculum is concerned, you know, the traditional curriculum, you know, I was even uh, that time, the, the FM people, you know, media people came to interview me that why your curriculum is uh, outdated and why are you continuing? Uh, it's again the bureaucratic hurdle, you know. One, one problem we, we had was uh, the permanent staffs uh, were all electronic engineering and uh, it was not easy to teach computer engineering suddenly like that. And so more, more towards the hardware oriented kind of courses. And uh, well, the faculties were very reluctant to teach. So because of that, then I went to Pokhara University. Pokhara University had similar problem. And uh, I, I was made in charge of uh, uh, 
drafting a curriculum for software engineering four years, BEIT, BE computer engineering, BCA. So for these four programs, I drastically changed uh, the curriculum design, which I wanted to do in Institute of Engineering, where I was not allowed to do it. It's a bit sad to hear, ma'am, but still I think what you have achieved in your career uh, within IUE, uh, I think that's really tremendous. And the impact that you have created is quite a lot. I hope now, you know, the management, the bureaucracy will actually understand the value, what the computing is actually bringing in the whole world. And hopefully there will be more focus uh, on this division and hopefully we can be, you know, world-class. Uh, I hope to see the changes very soon as well, ma'am, on this side. And again, uh, you know, hats up to your commitment in terms of uh, um, you know, uplifting the Pokhara University curriculum, where probably you would give a little bit more freedom. So you were able to use your intellect to, you know, make the changes quite rapidly as well. Um, okay, ma'am. So going back to uh, your, you know, teaching experience itself. Um, so, um, I mean, 50 years back, we already mentioned you were like, you know, two or three girls within the engineering faculty when you studied in India. How was your experience, ma'am, within IOE? You know, how many female engagement were there in terms of, you know, people coming to study engineering and how that has transformed and changed recently, ma'am? Well, uh, yeah, it, it was very, again, like in IIT, IIT, IITs in India, you know, a very competitive environment. So getting into IOE full job was very competitive and girls couldn't make it. And uh, them didn't have a support from the house. The supportive environment was not there for the girls. So, so where I really uh, fought for it, it was, you know, having a girls quota, girls quota and, and the girls hostel in IOE. So that, that, was, that had to be really hammered. And actually with the World Bank Fund, we had a building for girls hostel. And uh, well, uh, we, we did manage uh, to get 10% quota for girls. After that, there was an increase. Otherwise, there were very few, very few girls. And it was very difficult convincing the guardians. You know, they, they, especially electronics, they feel that it's a very difficult subject. And, uh, and of course, even computer, a very difficult area. So I, I, I had to go around convincing guardians. That's really great. To, yeah. That's really great to hear, ma'am. That yeah. you know you fought for uh, the quota system where girls were given a special privilege to be selected to yeah. study there and get a scholarship. Um, yeah. Especially opening the hostel as well, which yeah. probably was breaking the you know existing taboo of you know girls cannot stay away from home at night time uh, yeah. and those kind of things. Uh, maybe electronics being a hard subject. That that's really great to hear, ma'am. And yeah. I think I would really like to thank ma'am on behalf of all of those girls who actually got opportunity because of the initiation that you took uh, during your you know career within IOE as well in in these days as well being a founder of girls in tech nepal and women big data nepal as well i have been working very closely with a lot of girls who has mm -hmm. been studying in IOE or who has already graduated from IOE and looking at all of them now, I can really see the impact that you have created, ma'am. I think uh, we are able to, you know, give opportunity to the wonderful talent out there. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty much sure they're going to bring a lot of positive change going forward as well. Thank you very much, ma'am, on behalf of all of those girls there. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, ma'am, going back to a little bit different context now. So, I mean, we have already seen your academic history, you know, um, 50 years back, you went to India, you studied in, in, in an engineering degree, you went to UK as well. Um, you know, you definitely had a chance to took an international career, but then you decided not to continue, came to Nepal, uh, you know, you, you know, dedicated your time in academia. Again, I think probably going to industry would have been a better benefit for you in terms of probably the financial side, going to NEA, maybe going to telecom, that would have been better, but you decided to you know, go into academia and produce this wonderful talent there. You mentioned last time that, you know, you were working very closely or you started a software industry as well, a software company, yes, which was actually helping a lot of organizers. Would you um, elaborate a little bit about the organization, ma'am, that you were involved? Yes, sure, sure. I started my uh, software company in 1991. And uh, that time, uh, you know, some, some of these organizations like uh, Nepal Telecom, 
And the first one I worked for was Nepal uh, Electricity Authority, where there was ADB fund to computerize uh, NEA, Nepal Electricity Authority for billing system. So, so I worked in that. And with that profile, you know, then Nepal Telecom uh, actually went for international tender and all the tender bidders, they wanted me and my company. So I got into there also. And, uh, and the third one was French grant for Nepal Water Supply Corporation, NWSC. So there was a French grant there to start a billing system. So all these three organizations, parallelly, you know, I, I, I was so active very active. Very unfortunately, I think uh, all these organizations uh, faced a big problem uh, about, uh, you know, adopting software. Uh, you know, the organization didn't have any uh, people to understand the requirement analysis. And the vendors had a difficult time, and, and especially Nepal Telecom had uh, the uh, vendor TCIL, they had a subsidiary wing called TBL. Uh, all the staffs actually left the company and uh, the whole software project actually, uh, they had a very uh, difficult time. And uh, my company, my staffs and myself, we took this challenge and uh, actually we redesigned the whole software and developed and uh, it, was, it ran from uh, like uh, up to 19, this 2018. Our system was running now. It's been replaced by Chinese system. So that, that, that was a great challenge. And the other thing I did was, you know, uh, developing a software for the telecom switches. So that was in C-Shap. And those, those are very technically challenging. And 2002, when the project started, you know, Oracle, there were no, no people in Oracle uh, those days. And my company actually uh, took up all these uh, projects and there was a project in finance ministry also and so you know like my my company was a big resource uh, center for these new uh, new upcoming products and uh, i did very well those days so many yeah starting a tech company in 1991 I would say that is simply a wow because, uh, I mean, computing wasn't even in a mainstream side and you started a tech company at that point of time. Um, I think a lot of companies, you know, that were established around 90s, you know, they have probably seen a lot of ups and downs and they have reached in a lot of different stages now. I mean, talking about the, you know, big enterprise in India, um, you know, Tata, maybe, yeah. uh, you know, Infosys or Wipro. There are a lot of different companies, maybe some companies like Accenture, Rackspace, uh, you know, even yeah. like Amazon and, you know, Google and other companies like which sort of established around similar kind of time, you know, they have gone in, you know, in a very high ranking stages. But what was the reason, ma'am? What was the, you know, challenge that you faced in Nepal that, I mean, you might have done really well but again, you know, it is difficult to understand where your company is at the moment and it is not well recognized in terms of um, the work uh, that it has done. Or younger generation like us, maybe due to lack of knowledge and awareness and news, we do not know much about it, ma'am. So what, what was the reason, you know, you were not able to probably, you know, excel that bar compared to other international companies out there? Well, I did. Uh, I did go to. I did go to Hanover, Germany, for international fair, and I did pick up one or two, one project from Germany. And uh, at one end, I was busy with the academics, and then running a program, running a company uh, itself was a very big challenge. And then I, I started uh, started uh, getting appointments for uh, some higher kind of management roles, and so. Those those challenges were there, and uh, actually uh, Nepal should have uh, the government should have uh, given a lot of projects for these companies, local companies, to bring up uh, the experience strength. Uh, for example, uh, in India, what happened was uh, Indian government itself uh, actually encouraged a lot of software companies to take off uh, internal software projects. And uh, and and uh, created a showcase internationally. 
So government was behind promoting software companies in India, and that could not happen here. That could not happen here. And uh, I must say, you know, like uh, my students, large number of my students went abroad to do PhD and master's degree abroad. They came back and they came back with projects and all things are happening. But uh, the kind of galloping uh, which should have taken place, we didn't have any support from the government. And there was serious lack of fund. And a lot of companies uh, suffered and this, uh, you know, many companies I know of, they were closed down. And, but yet it is young, younger, the later, uh, younger generations, uh, large number of my students, they have done well. They are, they are bringing a lot of projects and they are, uh, but still uh, the problem here is, what I would like to highlight is uh, the rental cost is very high. A good, a good uh, software company, let's say, having a staff of 400 people, you know, would have at least 50 uh, vehicles and the parking and the hundreds of, let's say, 350 motorcycles. And to have that kind of space in Kathmandu Valley is very costly. So that cost itself is a factor. Although you say that Nepalese people are low, you know, cheaper than India, but I, I don't... I don't see really in true sense it doesn't, it's not true. One is rental cost. For example, NCEL, I heard in, in uh, which place? NCEL has, uh, is paying some one crore rupees per month. Yeah, yeah, one crore rupees. So the rent, uh, so rent itself is a big chunk of money that uh, brings down the cost of the, running cost of the company. That's interesting. Inside, yeah. ma'am, that you have brought across because some of the challenges that you mentioned were yes. um, the support from the government, where obviously yes. if the government was supporting on procuring locally made, you know, softwares yes. and applications, probably yes. that would have promoted, uh, you of know, course. companies yes. like yours. And maybe we could have seen the bigger version of the organization that you started back in 1991. Yes. And yes. we may not necessarily need to have, you know, imported a lot of softwares from yes. India and international for government and major enterprise and bankings as well. So I think yes. that that's a really interesting point, ma'am, that you have raised there. And I think another interesting point, ma'am, that you highlighted was, um, I think on our previous conversation as well, you mentioned a lot of people, um, you know, the Oracle was a very big demand at that time and you, mm -hmm. uh, and the organization actually sent a lot of people, I think in Europe or USA to study Oracle. But when they yes. came back within a couple of months time, they all actually left country and they, were, they went to US. So there was like a clear, you know, the vacuum of the talent as well there. You know, there was like a necessity to develop the application database systems. Yes, but sure. those talented uh, people who were supposed to stay in Nepal and who would have actually contributed quite a lot actually left and went to international uh, for their own benefit one way or another. Um, that, that seems like a very, you know, interesting challenge there as well. And the other point, ma'am, that you mentioned is, um, you know, regarding the cost as well. And yes, the in, cost. In, in, in a true sense, ma'am, I think that's 100% right as well, because, I mean, even though the Indian currency is 1.6 times, um, you know, the uh, Nepal is like 1.6 times Indian currency or something similar, uh, but the operating cost in India seems to be much, much lower compared to the operating cost in Nepal. Of course, of course. I'll tell you one more example. You mentioned. Sure. For example, suppose a company has to hire, suppose I have to hire a cyber security expert. Okay, that's very costly. In India, cyber security uh, expert, let's say it costs uh, to hire per month, two lakh rupees. Here, you give two and a half lakh, suppose. Okay, the moment that cyber security expert leaves the company or leaves Nepal, then what choice Nepalese company have in India, in, in the same cybersecurity expert, if he leaves, there'll be long and, and, and the company advertises for next uh, uh, person. There, there's a long queue of cybersecurity experts available, ready the second day. So then which one becomes uh, expensive and which one becomes this thing? So they, they have, they can hire the day one, the other person, the person, existing person leaves 
And here, the person, if he leaves, we are in disaster. The project goes into disaster. So exactly. then, uh, then so you have to have some two, three people extra in the company to, to be secure and take the risk of losing the, that particular staff, right? So that means, you know, the cost is two, three times more expensive. So it, it, it is expensive. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's a very valid point, ma'am. The buffer that we have to The other thing is, other thing is, suppose, suppose there is a project. Okay, before actually the possible award of the project, how can you hire six people beforehand some six months ago that, okay, project will come and then you, you know, you start functioning. So you have to pre-invest on six, seven people to adjust to the project. In India, if, if a company gets one project, on the spot, he puts an advertisement, on the spots, he 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 get they they get the company gets excellent staffs on the spot. So which which one becomes more expensive and which is the operating cost? So we are not. Definitely, ma'am. I think uh, you have actually spoken out of your experience, and this is a typical challenge because I would say it's a chicken and egg problem because either we you know we get chicken first or egg first because. If we get project, then we don't get actually resource to work on the project. And yes. if we keep on, you know, maintaining the resource, if we do not get the project, then, you know, the company is going on loss yes. as well. Yes. And the other problem becomes like, if we keep on investing on the resources in a six months time, in a year time, they leave us. And then, you know, the company would be in a, again, great loss because now they don't have, you know, they wasted the money. They don't have resource to do the work as well. And they have to invest again to do the same project. So it's a very typical challenge out there, ma'am. And again, highlighting some of the other expenses. Shall, shall I tell you one more challenge? Thank you, I think things are going to be worse. I think uh, with the current scenario in India, as well as China or abroad, you know, a lot of uh, latest technology products are getting, you know, implemented and tested in their countries faster than us. So when you procure such solutions, you know, like Nepalese companies to compete with such uh, companies becomes very, very hard. Yeah, exactly, ma'am. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's, that another it, it, that's another challenge. Yeah, it, it makes our overall, you know, cost of production very higher as well. Yeah. And I think some of the other areas that you mentioned as well, ma'am, the, you know, rental costs and not only rental costs, like, uh, for example, the lack of electricity, you know, we used to have 18 hours load setting. Luckily, you know, it was, I mean, we sort of recovered, but I have heard that, you know, it is again, you know, we are having issues. And I think probably that's one of the examples, ma'am, you know, you have to probably move from your existing place and then come to a different place where there was yeah. like proper electricity, yeah. right? So now maintaining the backup electricity, maintaining the solar, you know, power grid and stuff as well, the inverter, and even the internet reliability yeah. as well. I mean, having one internet is not sufficient. We need to have two or even three or yeah. multiple internets. I think that also add up on the cost of production as well. So ma'am, looking on all of these issues, ma'am. Um, so, you know, you have been working very closely with Computer Association of Nepal in the past as well. You have worked with industry as well. What do you think, ma'am, the government need to do or the policymakers need to change in order to, you know, bring the environment which is positive for tech companies to grow, ma'am? Well, uh, this COVID uh, and earthquake, COVID and COVID-19, uh, uh, this uh, pandemic and earthquake actually has taught us a lot of lessons, I think, and to go for uh, very digital, digitalized society. So... For software companies, by telling all these challenges, I don't want to really discourage software companies, not at all. But uh, there, there are rooms, there are rooms where you can play. For example, rural area, you know, uh, ward level, uh, provincial level. So all, all these levels, you know, they, they, they have to aggressively work with, along with NGOs and INGOs and government. Uh, and uh, uh, through these provinces and uh, the, the ward and municipalities, I think there are a lot of rooms where we can really penetrate and uh, bring, uh, add values to the services. For example, yeah, health sector. 
plenty of rooms plenty of rooms you know like uh, companies although it's very hard but uh, you know there are, those are uh, doors opening and uh, i'm sure they have a lot of scope here also so ma'am going back to you know the history that you have created um, i think um, it, it's it's uh, probably a very high time and again i would like to congratulate ma'am you know you got selected as uh, you know uh, ict women icon award for 2020 um, i think um, you know it's it's really great to see that you know the contribution that you have made uh, you know you were recognized for that as well in one way or another um right so what you have done and in the award itself ma'am you have actually you know given a very bold statement in terms of why uh, you know the it companies the tech companies in nepal are not you know growing so rapidly so again ma'am i would like to highlight on few points that you addressed there and if you want to you know add anything on those points on the clear policy government need to change ma'am to uh, you know help tech companies grow in nepal and similarly the international companies to come to nepal as well okay that's a good point that's a very good point the issues i i had a very short time given for me in that uh, platform to speak out so that was very short time given to me so i had to really bluntly spell out four or five quick 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 and uh, <laughs> which may may not be very appealing for the minister there in the audience the secretary and the planning commission members everybody around you know i i just big bang uh, i threw it there which i would like to clarify here i think that those those issues i'd like to clarify is uh, basically uh, i think lot of homework by planning commission by the science and technology ministry and uh, less the prime minister's office lot of work, homework in paper in paper seems to have been done okay and uh, that should encourage uh, international people to come in and invest and uh, that should have encouraged lot of local companies to go ahead move ahead those opportunities are there in paper but in reality in the process in the process lot of companies have a, a great grievances of uh, you know like go and burn your fingers you lose 2 3 crores okay but you know those people who are coming with bigger package of financial uh, package and they don't want to burn their fingers they want long term policy long term plan where they can be secure okay where they the the international investors or local investors are welcome with red carpet with red carpet mind you and and take them as a development partner they have come to help nepal not to earn you know i think so this this has to be really well clarified among the bureaucrats of nepal that if anybody comes with a big package of fund and then comes here and then think that oh they have come to earn which is which i feel very strongly feel should not be taken from that perspective maybe some some people some some companies are like that but majority of people we have to welcome them as as investors who have to actually who have come here to generate large number of employment as well as well develop the country so that is uh, that is where uh, it is it this is this is uh, this country is not called uh, trustworthy you know they don't trust investing here and uh, they don't they find this country as a very risk risk prone country that you go exactly, and exactly ma'am exactly yeah. i think in various forums you have actually mentioned very boldly that you know it doesn't matter how much you are actually earning it actually matters how much employment you are actually creating exactly. you know i i think th- th- that's a key concern actually because it doesn't matter you know whether you are millionaire or billionaire by opening a company in nepal i think what matters is like how many people's life you are actually changing by providing employment to them and i think we really need to have industries in nepal ma'am in my opinion where we can actually employ thousands and thousands of people i think that's sort of yes. absolute key and necessity and some of the points ma'am in various forums that you have mentioned which i really like to highlight here you know the government clearly should have a policy on tax holidays for it companies yes. locally yes. on any international companies 
you know, who should be coming to mention this. <laughs> exactly. Any international companies, you know, who are looking to come to Nepal, they, 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 they should be, you know, treated in a special way such that probably, you know, they get a lot of support on repatriation, they get a lot of support on taxation, they get a lot of support on maybe recruiting human resource, maybe, you know, one door policy on the investment side. And ma'am, talking on the same side, as you know, you know, the foreign direct investment policy of Nepal had changed where previously the minimum yeah. investment that need to be done was around $50,000. Now it yeah. has gone up to half a million dollars as well, ma'am. Yes. So what yeah. is your view and opinion on that? Well, they, they have brought out uh, policies like uh, residential visa, you know, if you cross 10 crore rupees, you know, all these new policies are quite uh, investment friendly policies. In paper, in paper, things are happening. So I, I feel that uh, the, you know, the moment uh, companies uh, start earning and they want to take out some money abroad, there, you know, to get approval from the bureaucrats, you know, one signature can destroy the company. So these so, kinds oh. of building problems which is, uh, which looks, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to listen, but, you know, uh, those long-term impact, the damage done on the company, you know, bureaucrats uh, here are not uh, fully trained or, uh, I, I don't know what, what to say, I don't want to talk negative, <laughs> I don't want to talk negative about bureaucrats, but unfortunately, the impression outside is very bad. So especially I see, you know, like Indian Indian uh, investors coming here, they find it very, very risky. It's the same story with the US and Europe. It's, uh, they consider as a very risky country, which is not good. And, uh, and it, I've been to Vietnam. I've been to Vietnam. What, why did a lot of uh, investment went to Vietnam? It's, it's basically, it's not only the regulatory paperwork, which was good, it is, it is, I think the people there were very investment friendly kind of, the bureaucrats I'm sure must be very investment friendly. So these, these, these things are, uh, have to be, uh, I think uh, there has to be massive awareness program on this. Absolutely ma'am, because yeah. You know, investing half a million dollar in a country where, you know, the rules are not favorable for international investors, yeah. I think it's definitely risky. And uh, it feels like, you know, rather than government trying to attract, uh, um, you know, international companies to invest in tech um, or in any other sector, I think it feels like, you know, it is a deterring uh, factor. And I urge um, all the concerned government or concerned bodies to look into the matter very urgently and look into how you know Nepal can be trans transformed as an investment-friendly country as well. Exactly. Okay, like so like uh, 25 years. Let me let me add on that. Yeah. Last 25 years, we've been talking this only. You agree with me? Last 25 years, you know, yes. all these nice regulation, nice policies, and so many good things. We have just been speaking and documenting only. But when it comes to implementation in, in, in really table level, field level, things are things are very unfortunate. Yeah, that's right, ma'am. I think we have a wonderful policies there. We have a digital Nepal framework, which is yes. pretty much, you know, nice and awesome in, in the paper. You know, yes. I actually gone through most of the points yes. of the framework. And I think if we if we actually implement the framework, you know, I can see Nepal, you know, literally, you know, leapfrogging very quickly but the problem i can see ma'am is different government bodies you know they, they are not too clear on who is going to be the owner of the framework you know who is going to do what and you know they all seem to be confused and i didn't see any of the you know the policies the plans that is outlined on the distant nepal framework is being currently implemented as well which is a bit same in itself because i think we paid a lot of money to um you know the, to the international agency in order to build the framework and I think, you know, going towards the payment itself, ma'am, so you mentioned that, you know, the development agencies, you know, we are treating them as if they are coming here to, you know, maybe earn the money, that mindset should be changed. So talking on the same point, ma'am, so 
we have seen a lot of international development agencies, you know, putting a lot of money. And if we even, you know, um, keep account of the money that is being powered in Nepal, mm -hmm. I mean, if it was given to a private company, I'm pretty much sure, ma'am, you know, they would have probably drawn the transfer, you know, done the transformation quite massively. Where do you think is the lack, ma'am? What's happening? Because development agencies who are being generous enough and giving a lot of funds, a lot of expertise to invest in Nepal or to, you know, support in Nepal. Government has also the similar plan as well. People are also looking for the development. But despite all of these things, you know, it is not happening there. What could be the reason, ma'am? Shall, shall I compare with what I have observed in India? India also ha had such support and has continued to have, have such support in India. But the, the kind of homework done by the bureaucrats in India, the kind of uh, pre-homework bureaucrats do in India is massive. Okay? And we are bureaucrats, <clears throat> bureaucrats, what kind of homework they do? That has to be compared. So ma'am, to summarize, you know, the homework, the research that need to be done in order to probably, you know, align these funds, align these resources is need is not being done. And hence it is not being as effective as it should have been, right, ma'am? And digital framework and all these exercises. How about the regulatory uh, regulatory reform of broadband network, which is not happening? Where is the policy for 5G network? The, the planning and the strategy has to be worked out. Uh, it's very urgent because you know uh, the the you know 5G network uh, and the mobile uh, you know based on 5G uh, phasing out of 4G. All these things will uh, you know gallop. It will it will happen very fast. And uh, you know uh, so the how do you educate the consumers of these networks? And how do we reach reach out to the villages so that users are in volume? So these plannings are not happening. So you know, like on paper, all these uh, digital framework, all these things are happening. But the real planning about network expansion, they are you know they are, they they are they have a big plan about 4G expansion in all the provinces provinces in Nepal, and uh, you know along with that there should be a massive plan for upgrading the network also. Because the devices, the devices you are holding, you know, you know, it it will be it will be shifting to a higher side, right? So the, these kinds of technology changes and technology adaptation. Let me tell you, in in coming ten years, a lot of things will happen. Ten years, this coming ten years, you know, there will be massive changes. So then, what is what is the use? You know, you have wonderful document and people working on it. That's why in that last, last uh, Solti Hotel, uh, I, I announced that, why don't you integrate experts? Exactly. <laughs> that, 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 that's absolute truth, ma'am. Yeah. So ma'am, we already started a little bit of technology discussion. Maybe I'd like to ask a quick question on that one. So as you have seen, ma'am, you know, the world is transforming due to digitization and cloud computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, IoT, AR, VR, you know, this kind of technologies has been the mainstream, coming into the mainstream itself. So what do you see, ma'am, in the current context of Nepal, these technologies being adopted and how they are going to probably, you know, transform the day-to-day -day life of human in Nepal? You know, what I'm looking forward to is fraud management of the hospital, all done by the AI. That will come. That's coming in US, in Europe. That is a big area people should really venture into. Other <laughs> thing is money laundering. Okay, money laundering it will, uh, will, will be actually AI driven and, uh, you know, those those things are uh, coming in a big way, and where is the plan for where is the plan from the government for these kinds of new areas where uh, it will give a solid impact to the society, and that is not happening. Let's say learning tools 
for example you know people are talking about zoom and meet and google uh, all, all these uh, you know microsoft uh, team you know now they have an experience of going through the uh, virtual uh, learning platform so on that you know like on that platform a lot of things a uh, lot of changes for the benefit of the society is going to come india 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 actually is looking forward in that direction in a big way okay so i think uh, rather than blaming uh, the government i think all the companies here the society everybody should actually sit in the boat and work together <laughs> Yeah. Really great to hear, ma'am, your pros perspective on you know how the AI is going to impact um, the you know the human life going forward, the money laundering side of things, uh, yes. the fraud detection engine. I think I think that that's pretty interesting uh, prospect, ma'am, because what we have seen the government and bureaucrats or politicians saying was like you know we are going to make Nepal you know digital Nepal maybe or maybe the city is going to be smart city and stuff, but that just you know got limited in the Uh, probably the you know the election manifesto and stuff but i think the depth that you have thought i don't think you know none of the bureaucrats or you know maybe any of the bureaucrats have thought that way if they probably had thought in that perspective i think uh, the investment the development the focus would have been definitely prioritized okay ma'am so uh, you know moving away from technology i think uh, there's quite a lot of technology discussion we have already yeah, done yeah. Uh, so we are uh, you know going to the pretty much you know end of the session now with a couple of questions are going forward so uh, from our you know the session management team as well if there's any question coming on social media please feel free to you know raise the questions as well so ma'am you know i was going through your you know blog and you seem to be blogging quite a lot as well so you have written a blog on mental health and where in your blog ma'am you actually mention how some youths you know turned hopeless with career and even with their life and committed suicide due to highly competitive academic environments i think similar kind of you know scenario was portrayed in uh, one of the very popular indian movie three idiots as well so yeah. what do you say ma'am in this regard i would definitely like to hear your opinion uh, in terms of mental health um, side of things as well let me let me quote uh, when i was in uh, iit kanpur i i i witnessed a lot of suicides and 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 some of my classmates also uh, went into crackdown brain crackdown mode so so it's very very uh, so we we really have to the government as well as the society as well as the guardians mother everybody has to really uh, understand how our brain works and how how you know like uh, uh, you know faith how to how to bring up children and uh, because of covid and economic disaster uh, a lot of students are committing suicide and uh, so that's why i wrote article in my blog site and uh, suggestion is uh, basically uh, prepare the society and prepare the ngos and igngos and the government and the citizen everybody uh, to actually be educated it's not easy to go to rural areas and rural settings and look look this is happening and people are not listening i have tried i worked for i am the president of women agency research nepal born i worked for that agency i am the president of that and we are supposed to be actually engaging a lot of ngos work with uh, mahila ayog of nepal with the samaj kalyan mantrale and uh, reaching out to lot of women okay and reaching out to lot of women educating mothers educating women could be one of the very big uh, area i work to my facebook page called timla emi thapa i have a youtube channel timla emi thapa and i've got a blog site where i post a lot of articles and that site is timla emi thapa so through these three channels last one year during lockdown time i worked very i worked i wrote and worked with lot of women through this agency and we really look forward to actually reaching out a lot of south asian uh, organizations Thank you very much, ma'am, for 
uh, you know, looking into the mental health side of things as well. Uh, this is something, you know, uh, which a lot of people actually face during their phase of life, but yeah. it is something which is not openly discussed. Uh, no one wants to actually discuss about mental health. Uh, you know, people feel like this is, you know, maybe some sort of untouchable disease and it should not be, you know, exposed to the society. But I mean, similar to different diseases, you know, people can become mentally sick and they, they just need some treatment, support yeah. from yeah. the society and community so they can come uh, come up as a better human being and they can actually well integrate in the society. So thank you for raising this concern as well, ma'am. So now going back to, ma'am, uh, you know, the, the women empowerment side of things, like, you know, yourself um, coming probably 50 years back uh, from a society where not a lot of female go to schools. Uh, in your own family, ma'am, you mentioned that, you know, you have, um, you know, quite a lot of uh, sisters. And all of the sisters, actually, you know, they, they are doing quite well in their career. Um, you know, you yourself is one of a very great example as well. In the current context, ma'am, still in the current context, even though society is, you know, focusing more on education, they have been sending, you know, daughters to schools, colleges, but what I still feel, and I think it's not just only me, ma'am, a lot of people, they feel is like, you know, they, they send, um, you know, uh, daughters to college and school, and a lot of um, parents, they actually send girls to nursing, and one of the reasons they send private for nursing is like, you know, maybe someone who is abroad, they, they actually come and marry the daughter and then they can actually, you know, take their daughter abroad so that she can have quality life. Similarly, I think, you know, a lot of people, they try to study their daughter. They actually keep, you know, marriage in front of all these educations, ma'am. So with your own experience, you, you know, yourself and your siblings has, you know, gone through and then got the success. Uh, what message you want to give to, you know, uh, the younger new generation mothers and parents, ma'am? One, one example I would like to tell is uh, there was a survey done in uh, Stanford University. Howard, I think, Howard or Stanford University. Why, why very few girls come for uh, MBA course in Stanford? And the reason they have highlighted is, you know, like uh, the age, the age factor and the marriageable age band and uh, you know, two years of work experience. So by then half of them are married and then you know, after marriage becomes very difficult. So, so I think I would, I would suggest uh, the mothers and as well as the daughters to go through a lot of stories on women, a lot of stories on women. This is very important because it's not so easy. It's, we are six daughters. My mother had six daughters and poor thing, she passed away at the age of 48. And uh, I, I, I was told that, look, you have to be like a boy. Whereas all my school classmates were told that never speak to boys. My mother used to say that you should speak to boys and be like a boy. If she had not tell, told me that much after her death, you know, what kind of mindset I would have had. I always analyze that. So the challenges are there. We don't have, we never had that kind of resources 50 years ago. We never had environment 50 years ago, like the girls of these days, but yet we were, we went ahead. So try to get connected with a lot of, success stories of women and their large number of them. You visit my Facebook page, which has got uh, live cases. We are like my class in my hospital. We had Anjali Joshi, who is the vice president of Google. We had Asha Goel. He, she did wonders in TCS. And uh, Narayan Murthy was a student in our IITK. His spouse, Sudha Murthy is great example. You know, go through those all those YouTubes and uh, articles written on them. I'm sure I can work out a chance of, you know, interacting with them, maybe on virtual platform, maybe I can invite them. Those are my connections. Uh, that's uh, yeah. real success story, ma'am. Really great to hear, you know, uh, yes. what you have achieved. And similarly, all of your peers that you mentioned, I think you all are like role model for 
a lot of female, not only female, a lot of young people out there who can actually, you know, look up to you and then see that, you know, what a successful career they can actually have in yeah. tech, in engineering, um, or in any sector, you know, that they, they would like to have, um, you know, a successful career in their life. Um, so, ma'am, having said this, you know, we have pretty much come at the end of the session. Is there anything that you would like to add, actually? Any, any uh, you know, interesting moments that you would like to share um, from your side, ma'am? Yeah, the interesting thing, I, I what I feel is being in IT field, you know, a lot of people think that, okay, you know, coding and then high tech, uh, all these uh, things are there. But, uh, you know, what you call self-learning is, is the area I found it very interesting. My batchmates in IIT, I, I felt that they do a lot of self-study, a lot of self-study. And this, the, the, you know, the tech area, the life cycle is, eight, international thumb rule is 18 months. Whatever no lasts for 18 months. After 18 months, if you don't upgrade continuously, you get obsolete and you become like a dinosaur, <laughs> okay? And, and then you get washed out. So this, these are very risky areas. So you talked about suicide cases, mental health problems, you know, all these things emerge from this. So from school level only, you know, the, how do you develop children with, with the concept of self-study, yeah? I think that that is very interesting area that I, I normally normally tell mothers and parents uh, this this thing. And other thing is what IT experts don't do is interact with people. I work with NGOs. I work with NGOs and I reach out to a lot of rural girls and the mothers and grandmothers. That's again again that that is so important that keeps you really happy and healthy. I would like to suggest uh, all these young, uh, ambitious IT people to actually interact with the mass because IT is very, very much uh, in terms of we have to move in mass and deliver, add value, you know, the whole value chain effect uh, and make, uh, bring changes in the lives of people, especially the rural areas. And, and that is the that is the area I really love, and I am working in that area. So blog site, my Facebook page, my YouTube channel is really helping me out. That's really great to hear, ma'am. Uh, thank you for highlighting the importance of um, you know tech and IT as well. Uh, we have one appreciation received here. So uh, you know one of the audience is actually mentioning that totally support for madam's view of broadband internet connectivity needs to be enhanced in the whole uh, nation of Nepal. So I think, um, you know, one uh, support on one of your comment has come here, ma'am. And I think from my side, I also completely, you know, focus and, uh, you know, add my point that uh, internet is a new information highway. And without information highway, I don't think we can actually make any further moment. And internet should be the fundamental rights of every citizen within the country. Yeah. Okay, ma'am, having said that, I would like to thank you for being the guest in our session. And we look forward to hear from you a lot in future. Uh, and hopefully, you know, you will be helping a lot of young girls and young students out there, um, you know, by being their role model and then, you know, supporting and inspiring them to have a successful career. Uh, namaste, ma'am. Thank you very namaste, much. Namaste, namaste. I really look forward to get, to get connected with a lot of girls and boys and we will work together. And Anjanji, your programs along the way, I think it's a wonderful program. I, I wish you all the best and please do well and have more and more people coming and speaking out, getting connected with people.